Okay. Hello, hello. You keep forgetting to turn your... I did, and I thought I had it. It was like one little notch. Sorry, guys. We are here. Who do we have? Let's see who we have so far. We have Sleuthy by Proxy, Amba, Angel, Julie, Tanya, Stacio. I'm going to go send out a reminder in our group that we're live now. Like my new... Digs, it's not new. It's my actual um, office, and we call it the Babe Cave because it's where my granddaughters play. And we didn't have AC up here until two days ago, so that's why I've been switching locations in the house. Let's see. will be up here from now on now that I have AC. Sorry if you guys can hear the AC, but I'm not turning it off. <laughs> it gets like 135 up here, so. Um, just sharing. Sorry. He hit it right back. I have like 85 tabs open. I know, me too. And I'm trying to organize. Hi, Wendy Whitebread. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Mama of Six. Okie dokie. All shared. Let's see. How's everybody doing? Oh, we have a guest tonight. Woohoo! He just showed up. Um, let's get him on. I'm so excited for this. Oh, let's get him on. Or did you lose him? Um, he needs to add his mic and cam. I'll text him. Okay. Hopefully that text him. Um, I have a story for you guys tonight, too, about Christian. This one's from Todd. Hey, Susan, do you want to text him to his phone and not to Telegram while I share yeah. the story? Oh, wait, he's he's responding. Oh, okay. In the in cool. the Telegram. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read. This is from Todd. I'm going to read this really quick. <laughs> so um, it says he wanted to tell a story about when Christian took his shirt off down in Lauderdale for the ladies and got them free food every day, but like, that's all to the story. <laughs> yes, we do have a special guest from Todd. <laughs> Alexa, we put a little spice in there. Um, he would literally go down there at lunch every day shirtless. And those ladies were probably 40 to 50 years old. And he'd go in there and show his abs and flex his arms for them and would come out of the store with three free meals. <laughs> those ladies Loved his big lips, every single one of them he'd meet. <laughs> <laughs> I love the stories that just make us laugh every week. Like, it's so funny. Okay, I'm going to add picture. him. Okay, are you guys ready for our special guest? Here he comes. 
We're so excited. Hi, Mark. Hey, Mark. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Sorry about the technical Good. problems. No, it's all right. We have them ourselves every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to our viewers, we have just a few so far, but everybody's going to freak out when they see Mark's here. <laughs> I doubt that. No, no. The ladies love Mark. Um, so the reason why we have Mark here this week, we this is totally off the cuff off of what we planned on doing this week. Um, you know, we had said that we were going to go over the corruption and go over the key players. Um, and then somebody decided to take to the comment section of our YouTube channel again this week and decided to tell us that we were completely wrong about GSR and how GSR works. And so I said, you know what? We're squashing this. And I reached out to Mark and said, hey, buddy, <laughs> we need you. <laughs> because I'm so sick of this narrative that they keep trying to run that that Whitley and Dylan didn't have GSR on them and that the only person that was positive was Christian. And that means that Whitley and Dylan couldn't possibly be a shooter in any shape or form. I'm just, I'm ready to shut it down. So I was ready to hear about some gunshot residue really quick. <laughs> and you know, you guys remember last week, I said in last week's live, I said, they feel like if they keep continuously saying thing over and over and over again, that finally maybe people will believe them and it will all just go away. But you can't just make things up when we have facts to prove that what they're saying is wrong. So Mark, tell me a little bit about gunshot residue and what it means in a case like this. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you guys and your viewers. Um, yeah, gunshot residue, also referred to as GSR, um, that's a, that's a pretty significant forensic application. Uh, anytime a, a handgun or firearm is used, particularly in, in the commission of a crime that results in it being investigated, um, GSR can tell us a lot. Uh, and I know GSR gunshot residue has been the subject of, of a fair amount of controversy in the Andreacchio case. And um, uh, the point is that GSR actually should play a significant role in the case. And um, so hopefully I can help uh, shed some light on what GSR is, what the investigative value of it is, and, um, you know, let your viewers, you know, determine for themselves what, what they want based on, on the evidence, based on the facts. Uh, um, so what is, what is GSR? GSR is, 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 like I said, gunshot residue. Gunshot residue actually originates from the primer cap of a piece of ammunition. Okay, so when I say ammunition, I'm talking about a uh, 45 ACP uh, caliber, <coughs> you know, ammunition, a, a cartridge, um, you know, a nine millimeter cartridge. Uh, all of those have, have primer caps. And the, the compounds in a primer cap are particularly antimony, lead, and barium. And that's the significant feature of what GSR is trying to uh, identify when we do gunshot residue analysis. So when a handgun or a, a firearm uh, is discharged or is fired, the, the striker 
or the firing pin is going to hit the, uh, the, the very center of the cartridge. And that center of the, 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 the cartridge is actually, once it's hit by the firing pin, it's going to cause a, it's, it's going to ignite a spark. It's going to cause an explosion, um, a, a, a very small explosion. But that explosion creates uh, gases that are actually going to, to ignite uh, and a spark that's going to ignite the gunpowder. And it's going to, once that gunpowder is ignited, that's what actually propels the projectile, the, the little piece at the, at the tip of the cartridge. Um, you know, in many cases, it's, you know, it, it's lead. Uh, and it's going, that is what is going to be discharged out of the barrel of the handgun and uh, hit the intended target. So when a handgun is fired, the, when that, you know, there's a picture, a, 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 uh, a cloud of smoke and, and you, you all see it on TV, on the movies, you know, many times when someone fires a, a, a handgun in particular that you see a, like a cloud of smoke. Well, that cloud of smoke is, is burnt and burning gunpowder, um, some part of particles of, of uh, you know, that are, that are burned during the um, explosion within the, the, the primer cap. And amongst all that residue is what we call uh, gunshot residue. And it's antimony, lead, and barium that as a, as, as a um, uh, you know, within law enforcement and the forensic science community, we're very interested in in gunshot residue. So when that handgun is fired, that that residue will actually be dispersed over a fairly large area. It can it can go as far as 18 feet in the direction of the bullet, and it can go left to right. Um, so those those particles, the, the gunshot residue, antimony, lead, and barium are going to be deposited on anything that is in the way of its flight of travel, its, its um, flight path. So as a, as a forensic scientist, as a law enforcement professional investigating a, a homicide or a shooting, um, gunshot residue analysis plays a very critical role in the investigation. And what you need to understand is that um, a gun, gunshot residue will, will tell us, as an investigator, it will, it will tell us basically three things. And, and this is very important. The first thing it will tell us is it will, um, it, it's helpful in, one of, in, in, in three different ways. Number one, it will show us the subject, the person with the GSR on them, discharged a firearm. Number two, the subject or object was in close proximity to a discharged firearm. And number three, the subject or object came into contact with an object that already had GSR on it. So in this particular case, you had two people that tested positive for the presence of gunshot residue or GSR on their person. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to mention any names, but it's it's critical to know that um, if if GSR is present, because it will it it is a very integral part of the investigation. If someone tests positive for GSR in a shooting incident, that's a that's a key bit of information. And we want to examine closely the relationship of the person that yielded the positive test to the event that just took place. So if you have two people that have gunshot residue on them, that 
paints a pretty important picture that um, will give us some, some very critical information about what, what their involvement may have been, what their location was in relationship to the shooting, or if they even handled or came in contact with the firearm or the person that had gunshot residue on them. So the bottom line is, is if, if, if you test positive for the presence of GSR, that's an extremely important bit of information. And the average person doesn't go about their day getting gunshot residue on them. Um, it's, it's extremely, extremely rare. Now, if you're changing your brake pads or if you're messing around with fireworks uh, or if you're, uh, you know, if you're shooting a handgun, those, those activities will, in most cases, yield the, the presence of GSR on, on your person, on your hands, on your forms, on your, uh, on, on your clothing. Uh, so again, GSR is, is extremely important. Also, it's important to note that even if you are tested for GSR and you don't test positive for it, that doesn't necessarily mean that you had nothing to do with a shooting incident. Um, so I don't want people to think that, well, if someone tested negative, that uh, they're off scot-free, they, they must not have done it. It's, that's, you have to look at, at, at the threshold. You have to look, you have to examine the actual items, the hands, the, the garments, um, and determine what, what the GSR threshold is. And it may not be high enough. There may be GSR there, but it's not yielding a positive result. But I don't, I don't need to go down that, that path because we're not, that's really not significant here. What is significant is two people tested positive for the presence of GSR. Um, so it is very important from an investigative standpoint uh, to look at the people that have a positive result and figure out what their association is with that incident. So I was kind of long winded. I hope it. No, nope, you were perfect. And was so I remember much you told I have us a, a while question. ago. Oh, I have a question on, on all the reports. They say they have particles indicative, indicative. Oh, I can't speak indicative, <laughs> but in Christian's first, um, first swab, the wet swab, he, there, it does say he's positive on his palms. So what's the difference between it saying he's positive on his palms and everyone else just being indicative of? Well, and, and that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and I don't have that, that lab report in front of me at the moment. Um, but what we know from, from the analysis is that um, are, are we using names? Yeah, we are. Just first names. Okay. Yep. Well, the female uh, tested positive for the presence of GSR on the back of her right hand, on her right palm, and back of her left hand, and left palm. The male revealed positive for GSR back of his right hand, back of his left hand, and left palm. Christian had positive results on his right palm, back of left hand, none on the back of the right hand, and none on the left palm. So that's, that's basically, that's your, those are your GSR results. Well, I think where the other side, what they hang on to is on Christian's report. Like the one that you just read was the ME one. So the one that they did for MPD. 
says that he's, it says the words positive on his both palms. And then it says indicative of on the back of the left palm, I think. I mean, yeah, the left hand. Um, and then in Whitley, Whitley and Dylan's, it doesn't say positive, doesn't use the word positive anywhere. It just uses indicative of. So I think that's so they, where the other side comes away claiming that only Christian could have shot the gun. But if he's well, positive they, they on his palms, out. wouldn't the gun be like in the way? <laughs> say that again. I'm sorry. If he's holding the gun, how could he get a positive result on the palm of his hand? Generally, in in shooting incidents, the a, a person who is holding the handgun and firing it generally is not going to have GSR on the palm of his hand right. because be, because you know he'll he'll have it he may have it on the webbing, not on the palm and on the and the back side of the hand. Uh, typically. Um, but generally speaking, we find that if a person tests positive, positive for GSR on the palm of their hand, uh, it's very possible that, that they were not the ones discharging the handgun. Right. That's what I believe too. And they didn't even well, do the test right anyways, because they just did front and back here. They didn't do the fingers or the web or the thumb. Okay, this is this is the deal with with GSR, and pe people want to hang their hat on on how they're interpreting the results. We we can't dispute that we cannot dispute the presence of GSR. Correct. 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 So what that tells us is that three people, three people tested positive for the presence of GSR, correct? Right. Correct. So three people were in the immediate vicinity of that handgun being discharged. Correct? Correct. Correct. GSR many times well, we don't use GSR to determine it is not proof positive that someone fired a handgun, someone discharged a handgun. What is important about that is that it, it is, it opens a window for us to see that the people that were there, they had something, they were, they had something to do or some impact on that shooting incident. Does that make sense? Right. Like, like Dylan shouldn't have any on him because he claims he did not enter the bathroom. Those people that had positive tests for GSR, excluding Christian, their worst nightmare is the presence of GSR because they, there, there's an explanation. And from an investigative standpoint, having GSR in a death investigation is a pretty serious issue. Uh, now, some people will also say, well, uh, the female went shooting on, you know, 12 hours earlier in the evening, correct? That's what they yep. say. That's that's what they say. The lifespan of GSR particles on the on the human body for a relatively active person is uh, is six to eight hours. Sometimes four to six, four to eight, six to eight. Okay. Um, when you look at uh, the activities of the female that she alleges that um, she went shooting the night before with a group of friends. And there, there's some question about whether or not that actually took place. But regardless, if it did take place, 
what do we know of her activities from the time they went shooting the previous evening to 11.45, 12 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock, 3.45, 4.45 the following day? What, what, were, what were her activities? What were the male's activities? The female... She had sex the I think between you know that evening throughout perhaps throughout the morning uh, into the early part of the morning is what I understand. So she had a lot of physical activity where she would probably be putting clothes on, taking clothes on, brushing her teeth, combing her hair, washing her face, picking up clothing just doing, you know, getting in her car, touching her steering wheel, touching the seat, you know, all this stuff. You you are not going to maintain GSR on your on your hands when you are going through those types of daily routine daily activities. Does that make any sense? Yes. So GSR, yeah. Yeah. the residue is 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 very fragile. It's not going to last. It's different on clothing. Clothing, if it's undisturbed, it can last five, six years. Oh, wow. But GSR on on our on our body, on our on our hands and, and, and skin is has a very, very short lifespan. And that that lifespan is a result of sweating. It's a result of you know, touching things, doing name, uh, uh, routine day-to-day -day activities, putting your hands in your purse, in your pocket, uh, you know, going through the clothes in your closet, you know, anything you touch, you're going to, you're going to rid yourself of that GSR. So when I, when we hear another forensic scientist will say, will tell you what I'm telling you. When we hear someone claiming that they shot a handgun you know, 10, 12 hours the night before, and that's what caused the GSR to be present on them. That that's a red flag. That doesn't it it I, I promise you it it will not work that way. So from an investigative standpoint, anyone that has GSR on them in a in a deaths in death investigation, um they they are they, they have a, 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 a they're they're a subject they're a person of interest and it, they should not be discounted so what you're saying is with the presence of gsr being on these people it doesn't necessarily show us who shot the gun just that they were there and that they definitely need to be looked at that's absolutely right and is it fair to say that because Christian was the victim, he would ness he would have gunshot residue on him, regardless of if he self harmed or if he was murdered? I'm sorry. Repeat that again. Okay. So, is it fair to say that because Christian was the victim, he can't move, he can't go wash his hands after he's been shot? It's fair to say that he would have gunshot residue on him. It, it is fair to say it, it's it's accurate that he would have gunshot residue on him uh, if he fired the handgun or if he didn't fire the handgun. He was because he had obviously he was shot, unfortunately. So and he was shot at close range. So definitely there's going to be gunshot residue on him. Uh, how it got there, that that's what needs to be determined. And if he was holding the gun, it wouldn't be on his palm, which we know it is on his palm. So he could well, not have been holding well, the gun. I'm not going to say 100% that that's true. But what, what I said earlier was typically we find that the presence of gunshot residue on an individual's palm uh, typically shows that the, that the person... Uh, was not holding the handgun when it was discharged. Okay. 
if if there's gunshot residue, if there's no gunshot residue on his palm, but on the backs of his hand, uh, uh, especially the backs of his hand, then I would be concerned that uh, I, 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 I would I would have to consider that he was he could have discharged that handgun <laughs> if there was no GSR on his palm. Because right. when you're holding a handgun, you're preventing you're, you're preventing the gunshot residue to 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 go between the the the, the grip of the handgun and your palm. Right. Sorry, I froze. <laughs> Um, I Ariel Alex asked if he put his hands up, like, "Hey, what's going on here? What he have it on? He would have it on his palm." That happened. That's a, a very. In fact, I was going to get into that in a bit, but that that's what we see. It's kind of like a, a yeah, okay. a, a defensive. Like, as you see people in and uh, sharp edged uh, incidents where where they're cutting stabbings um, and they're the victim and they're being assaulted you know they'll they'll get you know cuts stabbings on on their on the palms of their hand just because they're trying to shield that could have been you know that that's it's very possible that the gsr could have been deposited because he had his he had his hand up uh, that's a possibility we can't rule that out mm-hmm um angelia asked palm results are not taken from swabs on the webbing correct or is that correct say that again i i, I you kind of broke up i'm sorry sorry palm results are not taken from the swab on the taken from swabs on the webbing correct is like she's asking no what they 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 swab um your entire hand your your your, your palm your the webbing part of your hand the back the back of your hand. Uh, let's see. So is it safe to say they were in the room with him when the gun was discharged? Or, or came in after? It's, it's, <laughs> it's safe to say that there, there are two possibilities. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, there's, there's, the presence of GSR does three things. Uh, and one of those things was that it, it tells us that the person that has GSR came in contact with a person or object that had GSR on them. Correct. Right. So it's, it's possible that so, so in answering that question, yeah, they could have gotten the GSR on them as a result of touching one or the other. There's three people in the room. There's three people that had GSR on them. So it's kind of who, what came first, the, the chicken or the egg. Um, but, but transfer of GSR is very, very possible, you know, from one object to another. Now, when you look at the location of the positive result of GSR on the male and the female, um, you know, it, it, to me, it calls into question. I, I find it very odd that if it was on the back of their back of their hand, what kind of contact would they be making with the back of their hand to you know, to whoever, to whoever fired the, the handgun or, you know, keep in mind that, that, that GSR, as I said, it covers a, a fairly broad area uh, within the area that the, that the gun was, was discharged. So it, it's, it's going to get on quite a few, quite a few items. Especially in that small space that whole bathroom was probably covered in it. Well, 
Okay, that's a good point. If if he was even shot in there. True. <laughs> well, we know he was know, because of the, know, the blood spatter. The yeah, that, blood spatter. The um, and that's a whole nother rabbit hole to go worms. down. Yeah. Where was he? How was he? I just remember a long time ago you told us gunshot residue uh, determines if not how, and it's always like stuck in my head. So now I'm always like, whenever fighting with the goon squad, I'm like, if not how, and they're like, it's not there. <laughs> like, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is this is the deal with GSR. Um, is GSR important in an investigation? Yes, very much so, because it because it 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 causes us to ask questions and get answers uh, from the people who have the GSR on them. The, you know, if 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 they didn't have GSR on them, um, we wouldn't we wouldn't be having we we would in all likelihood not be having this conversation right now. Right. So, so the presence of GSR automatically, um, in, in, in conjunction with the other evidence that, that's been gathered, collected, obtained, may, makes those two people um, significant players in this, in this investigation. So and it's no, go ahead. So I was just going to say, so as an investigator, it, it's, it, it's, there, there's a lot of questions that we need to get answers to. Um, you know, if this, if this was, if, if they weren't in the apartment, it would be a whole different, it would be a whole different ball game, but because they were in the apartment, because, um, uh, there was a situation at a bank. There was a trip to Chick-fil-A. Uh, there was some discussion about, um, you know, uh, what they were doing, you know, throughout that day. All these things raise some very interesting uh, topics or questions about what really went on between those three individuals. And the fact that they have GSR on them puts them puts them in a very, very tight spot. When I say tight spot, I mean the area in which that that death occurred. So they um, yeah, they, um, they, they have a lot of a lot of questions to answer. Uh, Tracy Ford Young asked, um, would gun night be admissible in court if GSR should not have been or should not have been present 24 hours later? Do you want to go over the courts and GSR and what that looks like? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly the question. Um, she's saying she's asking it. In other words, their GSR would have been worn off washed off 20 ish hours later. So would it, if they were to take GSR to court and then the female use gun night as her alibi for having GSR on her, would that be admissible? Oh, it's, I mean, it's quite possible. It all depends on how the evidence is uh, introduced by, you know, by the state or by the defense and, and, you know, how it's, how it's argued or objected to and how it's overruled or sustained by the judge. So it's really, it's really hard to say. Right. Um, does anybody else have questions about GSR for Mark? Mark, do you want to stick around while we go over the key players and the corruption or anything else you want to talk about? I'd, I'd be happy to stick around if you don't mind. No, we'd love it. If you guys have other questions about GSR, let us know. Oh wait, I just want to, just want to one more time say, 
just because their their reports don't say positive, that doesn't mean that they were negative, right? <laughs> Indicative uh, is the same thing as positive. Yeah, look look at that word. That's that's a <laughs> what what's the difference between indicative and not indicative? It's not there, <laughs> right? I mean, well, that's why I was saying that they they hang on that one little thing in Christian's report. That's that one two sentences that's different from all the other reports, and so, they try and make it seem like it's something that it's not. So here's a conspiracy theory. So is it possible that the report could have been? The, the verbiage of that report could have been crafted in such a way to kind of straddle, yep. straddle the fence. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Not saying it is positive, but not saying it isn't it's positive. Right. right. Conspiracy theory. Yeah. Well, Do we I see do many do. conspiracy theories in our in, in, in our government today? <laughs> None. Not one. <laughs> Not a one. Everything is on the up and up. And let me tell you, we, uh, we, <laughs> oh God. So we decided that this week was going to be the key players. And then we were going to go over the corruption that was in Meridian. And so we've been working on the corruption for, you know, getting ready for today. And, um, at the 11th hour, I was still digging and finding more corruption in Meridian and more and more and more. And like, I literally couldn't stop because it is deeper than anybody could ever imagine. And it just makes me wonder how people actually live there because I would be afraid for my life to live there. And we'll get there. Well, so I, let's go. I, I did a, you, I did, if I may, um, go ahead. one of the yeah. things I'm, one of the things I've been looking at too is is the the C word in Meridian. I did a I did a YouTube video months ago about um, the problems that the citizens of Meridian, Mississippi, face on a daily basis, and the the calls I received, the text messages, the emails. Uh, you you would not believe how bad it really is there, and and we're talking Ooh, about. I believe it. Um, well, a lot of people don't, but they need to start believing it because it's real. It's happening. It's happening now, um, and it's and it it's going to continue until someone comes in and, and decides that you know what we're not going to take this. We're not going to live like this anymore. Uh, so yeah, it's it's bad. Um, it's bad and yeah. it's it's particularly bad in their court system um, as well. Uh, not all just the way from the top. all the way from the top. We're looking mayor down, and it is disgusting. Yeah. Um, so let's just start going out uh, over the key players. Some of these we're not going to go over because I don't. You know, um, also want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to Angelia for putting this together for us. It is quite amazing and thorough, and we couldn't um, have asked for a better team of helpers. So thank you, thank you. Um, so we'll start with the red, and of course we have Todd and Ray. Those are Christian's parents. And let me pull up my file really quick. Okay, so Todd is Christian's dad, Ray is Christian's mom, um, Josh is Christian's brother, and he was uh, also working for a tugboat company at the time, or I believe Magnolia Marine at the same time. Um, and he left for work February 7th, 2014, when he was allowed back in the apartment. He described it as having been trashed and found that Christian bed had been slashed um alexa is christian's younger sister uh she is also a person that had gotten into a verbal altercation with dylan after her brother's death um and there is video of that on youtube if you guys are interested in looking at uh, dylan's behavior 
after his best friend died. Um, let's see. Christian, we know who he is. Chris T is Ray's brother, and he's Christian's uncle. He's also very um, involved in the case. He was uh, one of the first people that went to the apartment after Christian's death, and he went to the police department and spoke to the tech Detective Thompson, who was at that time interviewing Whitley, and he got the Christian's phone back from Whitley um, and his keys. He drove to New Orleans that same night to pick Josh up from the boat, and then him and Josh went to the apartment the next day and took pictures of the things that they saw, blood spatter outside the bathroom door and the tub basin, but no blood spatter in the bathroom. Um, they saw the hole in the wall by the electrical outlet. He's also the executor of Christian's estate. Judge T is Ray's dad and Christian's grandfather. He's a, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but he's a federal judge or was a federal judge. He's a retired judge in Meridian. Um, over to the left, we have Avery's family and Avery is Christian's longtime girlfriend and they had broken up prior to Christian's death. Obviously he was with Whitley and her family is listed. Uh, the investigators we have listed are Dubord and he reviewed Christian's case, summarized the items that warranted further investigation. Max Mays, he was the PI hired by Christian's family and he was interviewed on um, Crime Watch Daily and that was episode two. I think it's Gail Mills had worked with um, Mississippi Highway Patrol, helped Ray get MBI involved in Christian's King, also interviewed Jordan Edwards. Knox and Missy. Associates, yes? Um, Ray's dad. He's yes. a, just, a justice court, court judge. Justice court judge, my apologies. I knew he wasn't like a civil court judge. I was just trying to remember the right words. Thank you, thank you for correcting me. Um, Knox and Associates are the investigators and crime scene recreation experts hired by Christian's family. And I want to reiterate right here that yes, they were hired by Christian's family, but Bilbo and Bratu were the ones that got together and said, we don't have the funding for luminal testing and said if the Androkias wanted to pay for it through Knox and Associates that they were completely on board with that. So while Christian's family hired them, that doesn't mean that MPD wasn't MPD and the AG weren't involved in this scenario. Um, the report prepared by Knox and Associates contains the findings of Dr. Arden's um, and includes the luminal testing that was completed in the bathroom, according to the grand jurors, who the case pr was presented to in 2017. The color photo of the luminal was omitted and they were shown a black and white photo. We showed that last week. Um, Dr. Arden is a forensic pathologist who was also hired by Christian's family. He is interviewed by Crime Watch Daily as well. Um, and we went over his report last week. Also, he's world renowned. I mean, you don't get much better than him. Our writer is the Faro Scanner uh, tech. He's the one that mapped Christian's apartment to compare the crime scene photos. He concluded gunshot probably came from the direction of the tub toilet toward electrical outlet switch where the hole was found. His findings were that Christian's legs were out away from the tub far enough to be in the bathroom door swingway path. Um, and Christian's work friends, we have Joshua B, Justin B, and Cheryl S. Uh, Joshua B is the one that noted that Christian asked him to check on his Jeep when he came into work and that it was parked in an unusual place. Justin B is the one that Christian called and asked for a ride. Susan, do you want to interject there? Wait, I'm sorry. I was no. <laughs> something on the text. <laughs> <laughs> Justin B, do you want to touch on that? Um, oh, yeah. He's the one that uh, Christian called first and Christian used Bongo's phone to make that phone call. Yes. Is that what you want to and, you know, add? Yep. And it says, although these calls are not on Christian's phone logs, it was noted that Christian had used a coworker's phone to call Justin and argue until the cows come home. We're right, you're wrong. 
<laughs> Cheryl S is Boat Mama, and we all love Cheryl. And she's the one that we interviewed, and it's up on our channel. But she is the one that you know let us know that Christian was not depressed. That his history of of these kind of things with Whitley was not uncommon, and um, that he was going home to take care of you know take care of things with her, get her out of the house, get his car back, and that he ate breakfast that morning. Um, Houston is the ex-fiance. They didn't get married, did they? Yes, they did. Okay, so ex-husband of Whitley's aunt, Kimberly, and he was allegedly present at Christian's apartment prior to the arrival of first responders. We have a little more to go on, on Houston, but we just need... Um, we need to do another interview before we'll go deeper there. Dylan. So we come to Dylan. Um, he knew Christian from school and became friends with Christian after he broke up with Avery, was driving Christian's truck after a party once and got into an accident. Later, Christian repaired and sold that truck, and he allegedly owed Christian money still for the deductible on the insurance claim of that truck. Um, he began a relationship, allegedly, with Whitley's aunt while she was engaged to Christian's friend. Text messages between Christian and Whitley revealed that Christian was aware of the relationship, but did not want to get involved and did not want Whitley involved either. Um, there were no phone calls or text exchange with Christian and Dylan in the months prior, but Christian called him for a ride home at 1.37 a.m. And we know after I dug into the searches on Christian's phone that he was searching for Dylan Swearingen on specifically on the Meridian Star and Twitter and Google. So he was looking for something for, about Christian or Dylan in the days prior to his death. He picked Christian up and took him back to Meridian. And we've gone over the, the timeline in depth multiple times. Um, Dylan's statement regarding events that occurred that day, Dylan submitted a handwritten account, which included a story about Christian holding his cocked gun to his head earlier in the day. Dylan reported that he took the gun, hid it behind a curtain, and later returned the gun to Christian and requested that Christian unload it prior to Dylan leaving the apartment and go to Best Buy. Particles indicative of GSR located on the palm of Dylan's left hand, his dominant hand, and back of both hands, despite that... He was not present at the time of Christian's death and did not enter the bathroom where Christian was found dead. He failed to appear multiple times to MPD uh, for a scheduled polygraph test, allegedly kept a toothbrush at Christian's apartment, and was often there while Christian was working, although he claims that he was never there. Allegedly asked Christian's grandfather about a life insurance policy on Whitley's behalf after Christian's death. Um... Sorry, I was just reading, reading Mama Six's comment. Mama Six, come back with that comment in a little bit. Um, Dylan's family, we have Pam, his mom, Ben, his brother. They both were allegedly at the apartment prior to the arrival of first responders. Um, Pam was interviewed by 48 Hours. Ben worked as an EMT at the time of Christian's death. Received a call and reported. He received a call and reported he needed to leave work due to a family emergency the day Christian died. Eyewitnesses report that Ben was visibly upset and crying at the scene despite not knowing Christian personally and having responded to scenes of other emergencies as an EMT. Uh, the Best Buy employees are Dustin H., Jared J., and Josh S. Name, they were all named as an alibi for Dylan. Um and not could not cooperate his testimony with certainty and the jared j began working for mpd following christian's death brett kennedy oops said the last name sorry brett k <laughs> <laughs> brett was dylan's friend and he worked at a bank and multiple calls mm -hmm. two from dylan were made on the day of christian's uh, death uh, oh snow <laughs> uh. 
um, including one that occurred while Dylan was at Christian's Credit Union attempting to take all the money out of Christian's account. There were several calls made between Dylan and Brett the day of Christian's death, including while he was driving to pick him up at like what, four in the morning? Mm -hmm. City of Meridian employees are Percy Bland. He was the mayor at the time, Richie McAllister. Mm -hmm. He's the former CAO of Meridian. We'll get into him in a little bit. He sent a FOIA request to the AG's office on July 8th at 1237 from a city computer asking that the case file be sent to his work email. A little odd that he, uh, as the CAO of a city, is requesting a case file. Um, he is the one that said, I've got to piss on some dead, dead kid's memory during a leaked audio meeting with the attorney general. Mm -mm -mm. The coroner and the medical examiner, we've gone over them. Uh, MPD is chiefly, he's the one that was, um, he was appointed by Percy Bland and he lived in the same apartment complex as Christian unofficially uh, alleged, and allegedly called for the investigation to be shut down after 45 minutes. He was fired in May of 2014 due to creation of a hostile work environment. Detective Thompson was the one that initially investigated Christian's death and he arrived at the apartment of 508. Investigator Sharp, who I, uh, I need to dig a little deeper but he's in part of this corruption stuff, the C word, as Mark says. Um, he's the head of investigations at the time of Christian's death, Chief Roberts, and he is the one that took over for Chief Lee in the interim. And Judge R. Jones is the one that signed the warrants issued by Detective Arrington against Dylan and Whitley for tampering, culpable negligence, and murder. Those warrants were issued in January of 2017. We have a bunch of personnel. Uh, we'll get into those in a different episode. Jet's family. Jet is the cousin of Matt Miller. Jet, Jet's father is Eddie. His mother is Jan. And his grandmother is Judy and Judy was in a relationship with Christian's grandfather at the time of Christian's death. Matt Miller is the one that was with, I keep saying last names, Matt M was the one that Whitley was with the night before Christian's death um, and that they allegedly went shooting uh, guns the night before with his cousin Jet and Zach Tab. He gave several inter interviews to different investigators. And in his interviews, he said that Willie shot the gun. Oh, sorry, I went, I went too far. So Matt said that Whitley did not shoot the gun. Jet said that Whitley did shoot the gun. So there's some discrepancies there. And I believe uh, Zach said she didn't. Right. Zach said that she did not shoot, and gun shoot guns that she was laying in the back seat and Matt was holding his hands over her ears. Yeah. Um, it should also be noted that we have now announced, thanks to um, a goon, <laughs> that Jet Miller was the third caller to uh, Matt Miller's phone at 3.44 p.m. on the day Christian died. So Whitley, Dylan, and Jet called Matt at 344. We were never going to name that third caller until you forced our hands. Well, she did it for us. Yeah, she did. Whitley's family um, is Christy, is her mom. She was interviewed by the Truth is Justice podcast and was on 48 Hours. Kimberly is Chris, uh, Christy's sister and Whitley's aunt. She is married to Frankie Wagner. We all know who Whitley is. Uh, Frankie W. is Whitley's uncle by marriage after Christian's death, and he has become 
I guess in uh, I guess no better word than a spokesperson for Whitley. Um, he is all over the place, and he is one of the major. I know. I'm sorry. Names. He is one of the major ones that say that um, Dylan and Whitley were negative for just uh, gunshot res residue. And we have a bunch of friends that were interviewed, investigators, and um, Dallas was interviewed by MPD in April of 2014, and we are going to do a whole episode in three weeks um, over all of the people that have stated that Whitley was very capable of planning, if not executing a murder. And she is one of them. Burns um, was friends with Jet and Hayes. He was interviewed by Sheila's investigative team in 2019. Uh, Devin G was also a friend of Whitley's and um, Chelsea's gave an interview in 2019. Travis, another friend, gave an interview in 2019. We'll get in depth into these people in like the next three or in that third week episode. Um, we have DA Bilbo and his son Hayes. Bilbo is a whole episode as well. Um, and Hayes is unfortunately no longer with us. He died of an apparent drug overdose in May of 2017. But he is allegedly the one that was told that Christian's death didn't go the way it was supposed to go. And um, he didn't believe it was a suicide. We have DA Coleman, who is the sitting DA in Meridian County and her family. Um, Jay is her husband, and he's the one that contacted the Culpable podcast producers and attempted to broker a deal contract for Whitley to share her story with them. And Dennis H. is Cassie's uncle, and he uh, was one of the people that were distrib distributing the autopsy photos from the case file. Zach T., is also a person that was at the alleged gun night and he claimed to have barely known Dylan or Whitley and he also said that um, Whitley did not shoot the gun. We're going into Jordan Edwards, Jordan E in a in an episode in three weeks so we'll go over her but she is the one that gave interviews saying that um, that Whitley and Dylan needed money for drugs and then recanted her testimony. And I think I hit everybody that's important right now. Anybody have any questions on all those people? It's a lot of people and it's a lot of stuff. I, we've covered a lot of it. We have um, all of the detectives. We've gone over pretty much in depth judges. Uh, Gypsy Ward is the uh, AG investigator. I read some of her statements last week. Uh, Marvin Sanders is prosecutor with the AG's office and we'll go over all of that. We did go over a lot of that last week in the, in the uh, grand jury, but it's a lot of people. And, you know, you look at this, um, this chart that's been put together and you think like how can this many people be involved in a cover-up but it's not this many people involved in a cover-up it's a few people involved in a cover-up one in green and one in let's see where is she why can't i find her <laughs> Oh, one in uh, teal, I guess, is that color, and some in gray. And then a blue. 
So, I mean, you get where I'm going. It doesn't have to be this huge, well thought out cover up for it to be a cover up in my mind. It can very well be one person trying to cover it up and you just spread it along and there you go. You have a cover up. Um, so now we get into, i got to pull this back up. The corruption of Meridian. And it goes deep. It goes deep. Um, so I started with articles and I just started linking to myself. And so let's see, I don't even know where to start to be honest, but I'm just going to go. Um, I found that in Meridian, there have been multiple arrests for drug charges that have seen no jail time, no court dates and no records for multiple people, and they're mostly young people. Um, a ton of sex crimes, not prosecuted, just not prosecuted at all. Um, I was gonna go in depth into the two DA's arrests versus convictions versus sentencings, and that's just gonna have to be a whole episode on its own or else we'll be here for 52 hours tonight. We just, I can't get that deep because it's a lot. So I'm going to start with this. Um, in 2020, MPD took a major hit. And according to an article from WTOK, written by Nicholas Brooks, MPD has had a history of unstable leadership. There's been federal indictments, a DUI arrest, a high profile termination. Uh, Police Chief Betty DuBose resigned in 2020 after serving with MPD for 30 years. Locals in the city are or in the city are quoted as saying, I feel the corruption is a big issue in the department. I feel that what is going on is wrong. People need to know more about what is happening. I mean, so people are seeing it. Susan and I put out a post or several times put out a post saying, if you have been affected by corruption, hit us up and not one person did. I think that they're literally scared. I would be too. <laughs> um, so I dug deeper into that article. Like, like I said, I pulled a thread and it just started going. Like I couldn't keep up with all this that was like following. Um, so the MPD officer that was arrested, what, uh, Roy Benjamin, and he was arrested and charged with two counts of extortion under color of official rights, which means that it's the wrongful taking by a public officer of money or property not due to him or, or his office, whether or not the taking was accomplished by force or use of fear. And it says, according to the indictment in April 2020, then Officer Benjamin on two separate occasions pulled over drivers in the middle of the night in Lauderdale County and received from each of them cash payment in exchange for not issuing the driver a ticket. Uh, Benjamin resigned from MPD immediately following public disclosure of the alleged incidents and he was sentenced, sentenced in March of 2021. Are you ready for this? to 12 months and one day in prison, followed by two years of supervised release. But I want to note here that these were federal charges and had he been tried at the city or county level, he would have never seen a sentence at all. I can, I can guarantee that. <laughs> um, I have a whole article that I want to read really quick. This was written uh, for the Mississippi Free Press by Ryan O'Leary, and it was in October of 2020. The title is Meridian Royal in Controversy, Councilman Leaves Town Saying Police Officer Wants Him Killed. It says, Thursday night at about 10.30 or 10 o'clock, I, I received a message letting me know that there were dangerous people looking for me because they wanted to kill me. The Meridian City Councilman and candidate for mayor claimed in a video statement Monday. I'm told that a Meridian police officer or other people went by my house. He added, I've asked around people in my neighborhood and have confirmed that people have been coming by my house. The Mississippi Free Press is not yet naming the accused officer. Dig, I dug a little. You can see the screenshot up on the screen. Lindemann, who represents Ward 5, told the Mississippi Free Press that someone shared evidence with him 
that a specific police officer had found his address. In a press conference last Thursday, the councilman announced that he would ask the city council to launch an investigation into various aspects of the Meridian Police Department. Specifically, he wanted the council, council to investigate the circumstances behind the recent promotions of two officers, as well as the conduct of officer uh, name withheld, which I'm assuming is in that screenshot, as multiple allegations have surfaced regarding the possibility that he's been extorting individuals for drugs and or money. A, recent, a source recently told the Mississippi Free Press that the officer once bought drugs while driving his city vehicle but was never punished for it, even as a superior at MPD heard regular complaints. Lindemann also wanted to investigate why the city of Meridian fired longtime officer Lieutenant Rita Jack in late July. For months, Jack asked the city, city Civil Service Commission to investigate a number of issues within the department. She was fired on July 31st. Uh, they say that she was fired for misusing a police software system, which is ironic after what I'm about to show you guys in a minute. When she saved changes to an incident report, she was teaching a class of new recruits how to use the software that day and did not know that she saved the changes she had consistently said. On September 1st, the Civil Service Commission voted unanimously to rescind the firing and return Jack to the apartment. I wonder why. What we've seen from this tonight is truly a vacuum in the leadership that we have in the law enforcement division. Commissioner, Commissioner Clayton Cody said at the time, he urged the city to quickly find a full-time police chief. Since Benny DuBose resigned in late January, four di different men have led the Meridian Police Department under various titles. Lieutenant John Griffin, whom the mayor assigned to a brief leadership role, resigned in August after Alabama police arrested him for drunk driving. Interim Chief Lewis Robbins resigned two weeks before his term would have expired. Interim Chief Charles Coleman resigned shortly after he ordered officers to cuff an elderly man at a city council meeting. Lieutenant Patrick Gale is now leading the department. Lindemann has challenged Mayor Percy Bland for calling Gale an acting chief. However, as the city council never confirmed him to that position. I mean, this article just goes on and on and on. Um, it says the CAO of, here, let me back up a little bit. The argument at Meridian City Hall led into Lindemann's announcement that he had left town. He said that he had planned to investigate the department and officer only two days after the tense council meeting. Lindemann spoke with Chief Administrative Officer Eddie Kelly on Friday and Monday to discuss the officer's alleged attempt to kill him. The problem was they could not find two officers that would be trustworthy enough to not disclose my location to the police officers that are trying to kill me. Do you understand that? There are people, police officers trying to kill me and they wanted to give me police protection. I don't need police protection. I need protection from the police. That's how messed up this town is. Just reading that, I, I should feel afraid, but I mean, are they going to come here? I doubt it. Um, it says the CAA was looking into the investigations. Mr. Kelly is still looking into allegations that Weston brought forth this morning. I mean, there's a screenshot of what was said. We have notified the sheriff depart sheriff's department last week that he has made allegations that someone is after him and his fears for any fears for his life. Um, it just goes on into, I mean, they're not taking the allegation seriously and this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> um, I'm going to play a little bit for you. This is a video called Money Bags, and this reiterates everything that Weston was afraid of. Let me know if you can't hear it, and I'll move my microphone closer. Can you guys hear it? 
probably can't, can you? No. Okay, hang on just one second. It's because I have my microphone on. Sorry. Almost there. Okay. This is a conversation between um, the Meridian County uh, developer and a police officer. Hey, you ain't here on the mayor's trying to get you to do something for him? Pause that for a second. Did you guys just hear what he said? Did you hear what he said? I'm going to rewind it really quick. Listen to what he says. One of those things, man, like Robbie was saying, 
he, he talks to Kim Houston. You know, she gets, if she does run and gets elected, so he, she said that he was staying where he was. But see, he don't fool with Kirstie no more, like helping this stuff. He don't, he don't do a lot of that stuff with him either. Oh, really? Because it's so shady. Yeah. Well, they're, they're right. Hey, did Robbie Kirk ever run for did Robbie know that the mayor was telling you to follow his people around? No. Or you want to wear up? Uh, uh, his only thing he just told me is don't don't do anything against what I'm supposed to be doing regardless who tells me. At the end of the day, Percy's going to you know, be okay, and I'm not. That's exactly right. And, and that's what's going to happen to Richie, too. Richie's going to get burned. Richie's going to be the sacrificial lamb through all this. And Percy's going to turn around and say, man, I didn't know he was doing all this stuff. Yeah, he knows. He knows he's doing everything. We know he's doing everything. I mean, that's what I was, you know, telling somebody other night. You know, it's, it's bad, but, you know, I've been at the vehicle with the money bags being swapped and cuts your money bags, you know, all that stuff. I don't want to be no more part of that crap. What Rewinding that, too. Listen to this. And, and that's what's going to happen to Richie, too. Richie's going to get burned. Richie's going to be the sacrificial lamb through all this. And Percy's going to turn around and say, man, I didn't know he was doing all this stuff. Yeah, he knows, he knows he's doing everything. We know he's doing everything. I mean, that's what I was, you know, telling somebody other night. You know, it's, it's bad, but, you know, I've been in the vehicle with the money bags being swapped and cuts the money bags, you know, all that stuff. I don't want to be no more part of that crap. What the world was it? He was sending you around to the bookies and doing all that stuff, too. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Swapping money That's back. That's all the word. That's what was going through the election stuff, man. It was wild over the butt. You know, they're going to get in the city hall and bringing it back. That's just a, some of it, you know, setting up outside of the city, waiting for Chuck and Weston to leave and following them, trying to get officers to pull them over. You know, all that type of stuff, man. That come from Percy or Richie? It sounds like Richie stuff. That come from just whoever. It just, you know, makes this bad. This is a police officer admitting that they were told to follow Weston around. A police officer. I'm amazing. Oh. Unbelievable. I'm not into all that stuff no more, man. Let them. Because here's the deal. They come from the UA. It's one of the good year. He ain't got a chance to a chance of hell winning. Yep. Because he lost, because the problem is he's lost all the black people. He don't have any now. Well, like I said, I think they're going to get out and to vote. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, he, he's lost the black ministers. He, he's lost, um, I know he's lost Ricky Hood, too, so. Yep, and Big Mac, William McNeil, Big Mac, he can't stand it. I mean, he, he's a man we've been friends for 20 years. He said, you go back to him. He said, I, I, I can't be friends with no more. Oh, you know, so. oh, oh. That's it, man. So. All right, so but, you, you don't want to come work for me at Montgomery for the. I'm telling you, this is what I've been doing for days, and just hearing that today, I was just like, I have, I, I, I could go on for hours, hours. Um, let me just finish up this and we'll come. I'm just appalled right now. Like, I can't. I'll come back to this. Let me. There's another audio that you guys need to hear. Keep in mind, guys, that Richie McAllister is the CAO for Meridian, or he was the CAO, which, if you remember back to uh, culpable and without warning and whatnot, they have that leaked audio of um, um, they have that leaked audio of Cassie and Arrington and I think Chief DuBose and they're all in that meeting about Christian's case and Richie McAllister, the CAO, is sitting in there and he's the one that says that he's going to have to piss on a dead kid's grave. Let me. Um, and also, like, I mean, Weston needed protection, and he even reached out to Mark 
needing, you know, asking if Mark could help protect him. Mark, do you want to talk about that really quick? Can you talk about it? Uh, <clears throat> I can, um, I can say that, yeah, he reached out to me. I can say that the death threats were real. I can say that I saw screenshots of uh, people that were desiring to set him up and do him harm. I can say that I submitted a proposal for his protection to provide executive protection. Uh, I can say that that was turned down by the city of Meridian. And that's all I'm going to say. Yes. Um, Richie is the one that was showing Christian's autopsy photos. I just can't, I can't wrap my mind around a councilman needing protection from the people that are supposed to be working with him. Like it's bizarre. And for it, it, you know, this all roots back to money. Um, okay. So I wanted to make note of something. So the audio of Weston and Bunky that uh, I'm going to play some timestamps of in just a few seconds, a few minutes, came out in J June of 2018. And in September of 2018, Richie flips around and accuses Weston of misappropriating funds because he went to a an event for the city like that he had to go to. It was like a thing for city council. And... He put his credit card on file, like he put his credit card on file for the hotel because obviously he was there for like a work event and they charged the, so he, you know, did incidentals for his room and they charged the work credit card instead of his personal credit card for the incidentals. So Richie tried to turn around and accuse Weston of misappropriating funds. I mean, that's how petty we are. Um, this is, this is another one. I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's super long. It's like 29 minutes, but I'm going to play certain timestamps and you'll hear Weston's talking to that same person that was in that last one. He, he, um, used to work for the city. His name's Bunky. get this to play. Mm -hmm. doing, man? This doing is good. How about you? Weston and Bunky. Doing and Bunky was the former community development director. Sorry. I don't know much about Bunky. I didn't get too deep into him, but he reminds me kind of of like the Gladys Kravitz, like he knows everything about everybody, but it's fine because it's being exposed. So here's one timestamp. Like, come from your phone, send somebody else, and you never did it, but you can make that. Kind of you, sure you, you know the reasons I'm not going through Stacey. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to handle it. And he, the whole time, he just kept telling me he was investigating it, and he never did anything. Yeah. So, well, just watch out for Richie. I mean, yeah. I'm telling you, he is. He will. He, he showed me how he can do texts on people's phone, like come from your phone, send to somebody else, and you never did it, but he can make that. He has showed me how he can do that. Really? Some type of software, huh? Yes, but he's very talented at that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, if you see his vehicle at City Hall, usually on Friday afternoons, and it's there. That's one. Hang on just a second. I'll get to the next one. Keep in mind, too, while you're listening to this, that um, Richie was sitting in that email or that, that uh, meeting with everybody about Christian's case, and he acted like he knew, like, where everything was in the case file and... Um, 
wasn't there stuff that was brought up about binders and stuff like that? Like, a CAO should have nothing to do with a murder investigation. Okay. Well, as long as you keep throwing bullets at Richie, though, Richie ain't gonna last much longer. That's the perfect unit for it. With the black community going against Richie right now, mm -hmm. I mean, Ricky Hood, especially, you know, Ricky Hood is strong in the black community. Yeah. He cannot stand Richie. He cannot stand it. Now, Richie had something on McGruder, too. Something about he embezzled money at Kosciuszko Boys and Girls Club and all that kind of stuff. But see, me and, me and Richie would sit down and talk about all this stuff. Well, he had on everybody. And Nubos was a drunk. And he had how many times he went to the liquor store. Wow. I mean, that's just the way Richie works. Right. Okay. Well, in tactic. So Richie knows everything about everybody. He um, maybe he likes to hold things against people. Okay. Here's another one. This one, keep in mind and for just a second, <laughs> hold it in your head. As a response to that, you know, before an election. He will. He will. Yeah. He definitely will. But I guarantee you, they, he done had a little talk with Justin and Twin, and they're probably following you around a little bit to find out what's going on. Checking your phone calls. Definitely checking emails. You know, he always checks everybody's emails. What, yeah, what's that? city emails. I know that. Oh. Oh, yeah, he does that every day. He has data processing doing that every day. Mm -hmm. So how would he and check phone calls? Don't trust Do I? How would he check phone calls, though? Oh, he does it. Somehow or another, he does it. But that is illegal. Yeah, but you got C.D. Smith over there who's right in the little pockets, too, over at Bell South. Huh. So Richie gets on every morning and checks the city emails? Okay, remember that email that um, suddenly fell into Frankie's lap that said that uh, Arrington wanted to be recused from the case? How'd he get that? Mm hmm. There's another one. Um, through the Freedom of Information Act, for the mayor's emails or anyone's emails, really. And so. There was an email exchange I had with the mayor um, where he was trying to claim that I crossed professional lines by going to animal control, for instance, and asking them directly a few questions. And he actually he made a, a claim in the email that just wasn't true about um, a citation that had been given to someone. and. So I had someone go and request the emails because I knew it wasn't true. And then I go in my emails the other day to, to like confirm again, what date that was, what date and time. And the email is gone. It's just deleted. Now I, I took screenshots of it, but that information can't be really gone forever. Can it? I mean, it's gotta be no. on a database somewhere. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's still, it's still on, um, it's on a backup desk. I see you Okay. He got IT to do that. Richie did real quick. Because he goes over to the mayor's emails every morning. He checks the mayor's emails. Mm -hmm. So that means that any correspondence that the mayor has had about Christian's case, guess who else had access to those emails? Um. But it's still, it's amazing because it's still been uh, unexplained to this day that basically in our cash reserves, we should have around 4 million at a time when we had only 1.9 million. Like if you add up the expenses over revenue and subtract that from our cash reserves year by year from 2015 uh -huh. to present, there's a literal $2 million that's not accounted for. Well, you know, you took your money under water fund. Right, so that was even before that. Oh, it was before that? Yeah, so there's, even before taking the money from the water fund to the general fund, there's still a $2 million hole. Well, I mean, if I was a council member, I'd be asking them questions because y'all are responsible for all the money. Yeah, my concern... Like y'all do every month. Yeah. It's, 
Yeah, I know to watch that carefully at this point. Um, but my concern is that, one, I'm not going to have the support on the council to actually have an audit uh, requested. Two, who who would we even go to for the audit? Because I can't imagine that the accounting firm that does our audits annually would be the appropriate. One more. Oh, they didn't give me a phone, but they, yeah, they, I, I could tell they had set me up with the car, but the thing is, it was an administrative decision, so if they were ever going to do anything about it, it was really going to come back on them. Yeah, yeah, but Richie, Richie was looking at somewhere that would get you with that. Yeah, I figured. So, I mean, whatever you do, just be careful, and if you're out somewhere, kind of look around, see if you see in the black, really, go following me around. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, when I'm downtown, that's, that happens. Yeah, and then you got, um, oh, what's the detective in police department, Arrington. That's who Richie uses a lot. And he has all his second and third vehicles sitting in the parking garage that he uses to check on people. What's the, what does that yeah. guy look like? Do I? Arrington. What's, what, what does he look like? He's kind of an older guy, got a beard, black kid. But he will follow you around. He's got a red Jeep. Cherokee and some kind of older car that sits on the second, third floor parking garage. Okay. That Richie sent, he sends them out. Richie sends them out to check on people on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll be on the lookout for that. I mean, it's, it sounds like Russian spies, but I'm telling you, that's the way Richie operates. Yeah. Yeah. You, I can ask him. Can you see some of it? <coughs> Speechless. Speechless. And that's not, I mean, I could go on for hours tonight on the corruption, and I'm sure that everybody that's local that would want to could too. But when you have players that have inserted themselves into Christian's case, part of corruption, you cannot deny that that's cor not corruption. That a mayor and his CEO are having police detectives follow city councilmen around because they don't like that they're on to them. Uh, I think it's time to just like, let's just discuss. Let's, let's just discuss because at this point I'm scared for my own life. Mark, do you want to come here and protect me? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to. <laughs> I just, I just. Yeah, that's it. Go ahead. I have no words. No, go ahead. I interrupted. No, I, you know, I just, um, my notes. It, it, and it, for me, my biggest problem right now is, is really. Like, what did he do to make this case go the way that it has? And why? Why does this affect Richie McAllister? He is the C or was the CAO, Chief Ex Administrative Officer. Like, bro, you're a glorified admin. <laughs> like, what are you doing involving yourself into a murder case? And why are you checking people's emails? And why are you switching people's text messages and why are you having people threatened it makes zero sense to me and where is this coming from when it comes to a cao like where is that coming from you know or, organized crime is such a a tangled mess and it, it, it runs so deep, it's so wide, and it goes back a long time. And a lot of people don't see it because they, they, they've become immune to it. They, they, they just, uh, they, they don't, it doesn't affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. So until it affects someone like the Agriacchios, like Weston, like 
others, then it then it then it rises to the surface. But you know, Meridian's not the only place, but Meridian is what we're talking about right now, and it's bad. It's really bad. And I just hope people one day will wake up and and realize what it's what it's doing to their culture, what it's doing to their community, to the lives of of the young. Um, there, there's, you know, when I went to, I've been to Meridian a number of times, and um, and I'm there when people don't even know I'm there. Um, but when you look at that town, it is, it's like. It's like something that you see back in the 40s, 50s, or 60s. It's, it, it's, it's been neglected. It's been, and, and, and because it's been neglected, and, and this is my opinion, just based on my observations, but I think if an outsider were to come in and look around and compare it to a, a similar size town uh, or city from where they're from, They'd recognize what what the heck is going on here, but anyway, that's that's enough for for now. Uh, maybe a different different time. I just, you know, I, we we said we wanted to get into the corruption and and um, there's no starting point and there's no ending point when it comes to how bad it is there. It makes me sad. Like I told Susan earlier, like. I Googled corruption in Meridian, Mississippi, and it was just pages and pages and pages and pages. And then I was like, hmm, I wonder what would happen in my town. So I like Googled corruption in my town and nothing. <laughs> I was like, okay, what's the difference? You know, like, I, I think it's because it's so, like you said, it is, um, it's behind in times. And so like, it's the, you know, the good old boys club. And so it's just... Go for it. Can I just address one thing? <clears throat> I know there's yeah. been a, I know the, the Andracchio family has received a lot of criticism because they're very outspoken. They're, well, not my words, but from what I hear from others say that they just need to get over it, move on. You know, they're, they're caught in the crosshairs of corruption. Yep. They're, they are trying to be silenced because they, they have, this case has risen to a, a very high level, uh, not only in social media, but a, across the country. Uh, but you got to understand who, who, who are the Andriacchios? The Andriacchios are a family that are just like so many families that are here on this, this program watching people that, that we know people that they're no different from, for many of us, but you know what? They had a son that was killed under suspicious circumstances and nothing was done about it. And there's a reason that nothing was done about it. I don't, I don't think, I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly what happened. Only two people were there allegedly that we know about. There could have been more, but we know at least two people were there that that knew what happened. Okay. I'm not saying those two people killed Christian. None, but I will tell you, they know what happened to him. And you know what? All the Andriacchios want are answers. They are no different than any of us. If it had been you or me, we would have wanted the same answers to the same questions that, that Ray and Todd are asking today. And they're not getting it. And how many years has gone by? Seven freaking years. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's egregious. Mm -hmm. And people complain that they need to get over the... They need to just go ahead and grief and get over it and move on with their lives and leave these other people alone. Bullshit on that. Excuse me. Nope, you're fine. You know, that they, they, you said the word fighting. They are fighting for the legacy of their child, for the legacy of their family. 
And, and, and you know what? They are doing everything that they as parents feel they need to do. And it is no different than what you and I would want to do as well. So I, I take my hat off to them and I praise them for their efforts because if they, if they shut up and, 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 and go away, justice isn't served. No. And it'll so be I, business as usual. Right. It will be, but you know what? They, they have not done anything wrong. They just mm -hmm. want answers from a system that is broken from the system that is corrupt from a system that is, that is, they're, they're dangerous people and they don't deserve to be treated this way. And I, I got off on a little soapbox and I apologize, but, but it makes us all angry, this, but this family is, is doing what many, many other families would do if they were in the same shoes. Mm -hmm. By God, I would be doing I would be doing the same thing, and I think all of you would be too. Yep, absolutely. I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, and 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 that's why we're doing what we're doing now because we want to support them, and we're not afraid of any like we're not afraid of the Richies. We're not afraid of the Frankies. We're not afraid of nothing that they can do to us is worse than what has happened to the Androcios for the last seven years. So bring it on. I totally, I, they've done a lot of horrible things to the Androcios. They've, I, even the entire community, I feel like this is people even in the community that have turned against them over this. I think that says a lot about the corruption as well, that the corruption extends even within the community. Mm-hmm. Because, like, well, was, I mean, look, there are arrests. I agree. Arrests, there are things that have happened. There, this stuff that's gone down. Where, where's the documentation for that? Where are the, you know, where's the arrest records? Where's the court records? Where's, where are the court dates? How are all these young people getting arrested for serious drug charges, and then it's just gone? It's gone. Like, there's no, there's no sentencing. There's no, there's no courts. Like, no court records. No sentencing. It's just gone. I mean, I know that I know that people roll and they have informants and da 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 da, but it doesn't happen to every single person. Not every single person gets arrested on a drug charge and then walks free as an informant. So where are these charges? Like they do in Meridian. Yeah. I mean, what about that one person who got uh, convicted of attempted murder, got twenty year sentence, reduced to eight hundred days, and time served for what they were already in for? So they didn't even do. 800 days. It's, you can get away with anything there. That is mind blowing. I, I think it's smart, Mark, that you haven't announced your presence when you've been there because I was actually going to go there this week and not announce my presence, but I'm going elsewhere now. And I, you didn't invite us? A fine thing to yeah. do. Well, I'll go and <laughs> announce my presence. <laughs> If I announced my presence, I'm pretty sure I'd be arrested before my plane hit the tarmac. <laughs> For some, you know, they'll they they'll get. Hey, can I? Can I just go ahead? Yep. Go, Mark. Let me just let me just say one thing. You know, I, I'm. I'm not taking sides in this ordeal. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the side for truth, for truth based on facts and evidence. I mean, as, as a, as a forensic scientist and, and criminal investigator for over 37 years, I'm, I mean, I, I look at things objectively. I let, I let the crime scene talk to me. I let the evidence speak to me. I let the testimony of witnesses paint a picture for me. And then once I have all that, I evaluate what and theorize on what happened. I don't, I, but, but it has to be fact-based. It can't be 
based on my gut feeling or based on my opinion or based on uh, it, it has to be based on valid information, good information, facts and evidence and science. So I'm not saying that the male and the female killed Christian. And I'm not saying that that Christian didn't do self-harm. But what I am saying is that, you know what? There was a bad investigation that was that was performed improperly. It was investigatively insufficient. It was incompetent. And there are many reasons for that. Okay. But they didn't follow the book. They didn't follow proper procedure and protocol. They did an income. It's incompetent. Boldface, capital letters underlined. It was pitiful, awful, egregious. And they should be ashamed of themselves. And the district attorney should be ashamed of themselves for allowing it to happen. Okay. So this is why the Andriacchios have been going on a campaign to bring justice for their son because they're not getting the answers that they deserve as a parent, as a taxpayer, as a member of that community. And by God, Meridian, Lauderdale County, owe that to them. The governor owes that to them and they deserve it. And I pray that I pray that this thing can be resolved, that the, that the, that the investigation can be completed and that that investigation will, will be based on competent investigative methods, procedures, and science. And that we'll get our answers so that we can put this thing to bed once and for all. Until, until then, we're going to be having these hate groups form, two camps fighting each other, and nothing but, but hate being spewed back and forth. And, and one creator knows what hate is, 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 is causing in her life right now. And it's not cool, but you know what? If you go there, you're going to pay the piper. If you're willing so, to step up and say those type of things, you have to be willing to pay the price. Exactly. So my, my desire is that this thing can be resolved based on a competent investigation. And then, and then, you know what? I have my theories. I've been involved. You know, I was all involved in this investigation. I interviewed some of these people. Um, I've, I've looked at the records. I've looked, looked, I, in, in fact, I'm, I've got several episodes on, on my own. And I think I told you, Misty and Susan, I told you about that, but I elected to postpone that, but I'm going to attack the investigation based on, what I feel as an investigator with experience should have been done. And so maybe you'll see me again, but I don't, I don't fault or criticize Ray and Todd for doing what they're doing. I don't fault any family member of any other family that's been victimized by the system because their child has been, has, has met with a very horrendous death that, um, that, that, that was improperly and competently investigated. You know what? They need to go to know to the end of the world to get the answers that they deserve. Not that they want, but they, they deserve. Anyway, mm -hmm. end of rant. I'm sorry. No. And <laughs> along the lines of where you're going, what does it hurt? Like, what does it hurt them to investigate it properly? Nothing, nothing. It's literally their job to investigate it properly. What, why, I mean, even if, even if at the end of the day, they come back and they still say, well, well that's no. a good question. But the Andriacchios have also said that as well, as long as they're willing to do this fairly and investigate it fairly and come back and present a fair and just presentation to the grand jury. And if they were to come back with a no true bill, they would accept that. The Andriacchios have said that. If it's fair and just and they've done that, they're willing to accept that. 
but that nothing that they have done is fair and just like showing that video of some man who, you know, committed suicide in a, in a police station that was completely irrelevant to this case. And so I think showing that to the grand jury was, you wrong. know, that's a good point. And you know, I, I do this every single. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Did he freeze? Are, Are you still frozen, on? Mark? Yeah. You know, I, I do this on a daily basis. I, I th th there was there were two there were two warrants that were that were drafted, but they were and I and I think they were signed, but they were not executed. Yep. And those Correct. warrants yep. for, were for the male and female that we talked about earlier. Yes. The grand, mm -hmm. th there was not an indictment in this case, not because the the grand jury elected to in, elected to not invite indict. It it wasn't it. it, it <laughs> how do I say this? It it was fixed. Because the grand jury, to my knowledge, was not presented with the facts of the case. All the yeah. facts of the case. Now, I can tell you, in my experience, there was ample information to indict the male and the female and then take it to a trial and to let a jury decide their fate. And I there think was. the evidence that we have now that exists, it, it, you know. I will tell you personally, having, having spoken to the male myself, I, I have certain beliefs now that of what I believe happened here. And I'm not saying that one or the other was involved or wasn't involved, but somebody knows what happened here and somebody know somebody knows what went down and what they're saying happened isn't what happened. And I think people need to get real honest real quick. People need to get a conscience and realize that this is somebody's life that was taken. And I don't think anyone who is on an opposite side of this realizes that this isn't going to go away just because they, they tell us to shut up, because they're <laughs> make, you know, whatever egregious threats they're going to make. This is something that within our country, within our justice system, everybody has the right to request and receive a fair invest investigation. And like Mark said, um, I'm here here and it's offensive to having heard a lot of these reporting tonight. It's offensive to hear what a lot of the people who are supposed to be in charge of this town, this county, the things that they've said and done to this family, all for just wanting a fair investigation. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what to say anymore about, I mean, it just, is it me breaking up or is it Denny? I think it's Denny. Your audio is breaking up. I, um, just after uncovering i mean i didn't uncover that that's all all that corruption that i found today was just right out in the open and it's just shameful shameful that we're even sitting here having to discuss this because the, multiple agencies can't do their job correctly and you know as professional as mark is and he says you know you say mark you you're not taking sides and you just want it to be a fair investigation. I'm angry and I'm, you know, I'm, 
I'm not going to blame because I wasn't there. I wasn't in that bathroom. I didn't, I wasn't in that apartment. However, when you have to sell something so hard, you have to sell a suicide or self-harm so hard, you have to stop and think, okay, why are they trying to sell this? Like a suicide, a self-harm should just, it should be, be that. that. There shouldn't. It shouldn't be all these other extraneous, like they wouldn't need to lie about gun night the night before. There wouldn't be conflicting stories between Jet and Matt saying she shot, she didn't shoot. She wouldn't have needed an alibi for having gunshot residue on her hands. Dylan didn't have to lie about certain things. Uh, why were three people calling Matt Miller at 3.44 p.m. when one was supposed to be at Best Buy and one was supposed to be asleep and you know like it doesn't make sense and if it doesn't make sense it has to be investigated there are not coincidences in a homicide in my opinion there just cannot be or even in a suicide like a suicide should just and i said this over and the over blood again spatter. right and I, I i've said this over and over again but i am certain and and I don't want to speak for Ray or Todd or any of the family, but I am certain that at this point, at seven years later, it would be much easier to deal with. And death is not ever easy. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it would be much easier to deal with a self-harm than to wake up every single morning and live Groundhog's Day. And the first thing be on your mind is, what do I have to do today to get justice for my son? And the very last thing the crosses your mind before you go to bed is did I do enough today to get justice for my son son and then you wake up the next day and repeat that same pattern for seven years and I know that that's the pattern that Ray and Todd live every single day I know it so wouldn't it be easier at this point for them to just be like I'm out but no because they they know in their hearts that there's more to this and they deserve Christian deserves justice That's my rant. Well, let me let me add to that. You you know who else deserves some help here? It's the male and the female. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're right. Because you know what? There's there's no. We don't have. Ju the, the justice system has not been allowed to work. The system was circumvented. And that circumvention created this, this mess that we're in now. It created years of pain and suffering, not only for the Andreacchios, but also for the families of the male and the female. Mm -hmm. So, we have we have we have a justice system that exists for a reason, and it, although it's not perfect, it's probably the best in the world. But we never allowed it to work, and there was a reason it was not allowed to work. There was a reason it was an incompetent investigation. There was a reason that we're here today where, where we are finding ourselves. Right. Yep. If it had worked, we wouldn't be here talking. Yeah. No. And I think once, once that, if that were accomplished, you know what? Everyone will pack up their tents, roll up their sleeping bags, go home and move on with life. But until yeah. that time, I don't blame these people for for the hue and cry of injustice. Oh, no. No. And you're right. Like, the other side have the right to defend themselves, too. It's what our justice system is built on. Everybody has a right to defend themselves. And what right now is the biggest mess <laughs> i don't think i've ever seen anything like you know susan and i have been working together in the true crime genre for 
five years now, six years, almost six years. And we uh, recently came upon another case that is on a podcast. And we listened to like four episodes and then we both were like, we're not going to Google. Let's just not Google. Let's hear this podcast <laughs> out. And then about the middle of the fourth episode, I was like, I don't think I can keep that promise. I need to Google. Something's not, mm -mm, something's not. And so I Googled and I came back to her and I said, mm, no, no, I don't think so. I don't. I don't think he's innocent, Susan. And she was like, uh oh. And so she Googled. <laughs> and then, <laughs> um, but we both have said we're going to finish the podcast out because his, his mother is adamant that her son is innocent. And we want to see like where the investigation goes. Like, are there things that were missed or, or not? And um, are there things that that could lead to his innocence that we're just not seeing because we're only four episodes into this podcast, right? But then I started thinking about it this morning and I was thinking about that show and I was like, these are people's lives. Like, whereas we have Ray over here who's fighting for her justice for her son, we have this mother over here who was fighting for justice for her son who was sitting in prison, right? And so we're kind of like, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, like how I'm feeling, but like, while this is us discussing something, these people live it day in and day out. And if somebody feels something, then they have every right to stand up for what they believe in. I guess that's where I'm going for it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think the governor has said anything about Christian's case that I've ever seen other than signing Christian's law, which was amazing. I don't know where they go from now here. Like, I don't know where moving forward is. They have to, um, they, ha they have to investigate. And Mark, how do you go backwards to investigate? Well, ac actually it's, it's not the best case scenario, but there, there is, there is so much information that exists right now that you, we, we can easily go backward from, from now to, what was it? February 26th of 2014. Is that, was, wasn't that the date? Yeah. Yep. We have, we have tons of information. And, and, and I'm telling you, and I'm not, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but there's, there's some significant information that we have that people don't know about. Absolutely. And I just can't wait for the day for that information to be revealed so that it can fill in the puzzle much better. And, 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 oh. And I'm not saying this, it, it may sound I'm biased, I don't mean to be. I'm just saying that the more information that we can, the, 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 the more pieces to the puzzle we can, we, we can put in. Um, so I, I, I guess to answer your statement or your question, um, it, it's, there's so much information that exists right now that I think if, if you were to assemble a, a, a panel of people such as a jury, they, they would not have a difficult time assessing guilt or innocence. And I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to indicate a leaning one way or the other. Um, there are a lot of people, I mean, I'm a criminal defense investigator. I do death penalty cases. I do mitigation. I see the worst of the worst in our, in our society. And we prosecute more people with less information than what we have in the Andre Occhio case. Um, and anyway, it's, it, it can easily, it can easily be done. Yeah. It's all there. It's all there. That could easily, I mean, I don't, I don't see how anyone could not see it with all the evidence like, that's there. We like bags with cats in them. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
we um, appreciate you coming on, Mark. It means the world to us. And uh, next week we're going over the MBI investigate. Nope, nope, nope. Next week we're just doing a round table. I need a break. Um, I told Susan this morning, I was like, you know, we've been doing this for eight weeks now. And um, this week it's was heavy. a little lighter, not light because it's, you know, someone's life. But the last seven weeks, I just get off of these lives that we do. And I just, I, it, it's like, like, I, I'm not even trying to make this about me because I don't, it's not my life. Like, this is something that Ray lives through every day, but it's just so heavy. So next week, just we decided that we're going to do a, just a roundtable, have people just come up on the panel and discuss anything that they feel like discussing. And I don't know, we kind of threw back and forth that maybe we weren't going to allow theories because we aren't looking to get sued. But um, I don't know. We'll we'll decide on that but then the next week we're doing the mbi investigation and then uh we're gonna go over after that we're gonna go over um all of the people that have said that the female i like how you refer to her is uh capable we're gonna hit all those statements yeah and if you want to join us next week for the round table we'd love to have you back yeah Yeah, I object. You can come up whenever you want. I just, oh, it just gets so like, I don't know how people do this for a living. I don't know how people like you do this for a living. You see the worst of the worst. Is he frozen? Oh, no, there he is. Uh, I, I lost you guys for like, a minute, so I don't know. If <laughs> we were. I was like, "Wow, he's sitting really still." Uh, we just uh, said, oh, "If I, you want to come, if you want to come on next week on our roundtable, we'd love to have you back on." Oh my God, I I would love to. I I mean, uh, I've got I've got a lot to say. I've got a lot of opinion. Um, yes. But I I have a lot of facts and. Yeah. Well, I, I like to stick to the facts. So if if you would would like me to join you, I'd I'd be honored and I appreciate that. Yes, we yeah, love we, we, we love, love it, it, love it, love it. And you know we love facts too. Like that's our thing. Is like we're you're gonna fight us with the case file, then we're gonna present the case file to you. So let's go. <laughs> you know, like that's what. Um, but yes, that's what we we've done love. this whole time. Every week, we basically read from the case file. So we're That's going off we have, all the right? facts that are out there. Um, we can't, we can't physically go to the apartment and be there on February 26, 2014. So all we have is that case file. And then any investi investigator, we're not investigators, any work that we've done ourselves. So, I mean, we're not out here being journalists. That's not what we're here for. No, and, Chris, um, and, Chris, and Christy's right. Facts are the facts. Mm -hmm. Right. Love me some facts. You can't change them. Uh, Wendy Whitebread. No, I don't think we need to. She is where she is. Um, it's been posted in our group, and unfortunately for her, she is where she is. So if she was there for this, Absolutely, we would discuss it, but she's not. I don't know, Susan, do you have anything to add to that? I, I just don't think that it's a... No, I don't think we should talk about it. There's that. nothing to discuss. She is where she is. Uh, I, if you were talking... I must have missed something on another little... Uh, um, well, well Wendy Whitebread asked, are you going to discuss the female being in jail currently? Oh no, that's no. I, I I don't have anything to say about. I don't know anything to say about it. So it's There's, to me it's irrelevant at this point. But yeah, oh yeah, Mama Six, thing. why did but, you? But I appreciate the question. Yeah, Mama Six said definitely investigate the Debord guy, Stubbs in particular. What do you know, Mama Six? Do you need to message one of us? 
Who are you asking? Uh, one uh, of our wanna... comments. Yeah, I see Mama that... Six. Yeah, I don't know what she's talking about. Oh, I it, I, I think it was, I saw an earlier comment when I finally figured out how to read, read the chats. <laughs> um, that um, sometimes you've got PIs that get hired to do things and, and they get a lot of money and they don't deliver. Um, I, I think that's maybe what. Oh yeah. She did say that earlier. The reference was made to, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. Christy. $14,000. Was that for a different family? No, that was for the Androcchios, I believe. I think one of the early invest earlier investigators that they contracted with, um, but but you know what I I'm I, I I'm not gonna address that. Yeah. Uh, Wendy Whitebread, no, she's in Florida. It would they wouldn't be able to negotiate anything for Christian. A lesser sentence. She's on drug charges. I don't know how much lesser she could get for negotiating for info on Christian. And they wouldn't work in Florida anyways. Anybody else have anything that they want to talk about? Um, or save it for next week and come on panel, people. Come up here. Don't be afraid. And Mark will be back. All right. So can, I, can, I just, can I just make a comment? Yeah. Um, I, I would urge um, our viewers to go look up the medical examiner, Mr. Arden, and look at his credentials. Um, I mean, cr credentials speak volumes about an individual's skill and expertise. Um, and and, and I, I have the greatest amount of respect for Dr. Arden and um, I, I just would urge some of you to go and if you're if you're interested, look at look at his credentials, see the impact he's had on the uh, medical examiner community, not only in our not only in our country but internationally. So he he wasn't a hired gun. He wasn't a fly by night medical examiner that was paid to render an opinion. He he's the real deal and i highly respect him and um and and, and i actually uh I, I mean i read i read his report over and over and over and it's solid so take a look at him yeah yeah every yeah, time we, we bring him up i yeah. always go down the list of his credentials i'm always like no you're not going to dispute this guy you're just not like i mean yeah i mean he's, but yeah it's he's the expert in Autopsy photos. Yeah. Well, and, and it, so let it, me it, just say this: no one. Go ahead. Oh, I was just no. gonna say um, it's insulting for people to say that um, he only looked at autopsy photos, and that's how he made his determination. That's what he does. <laughs> talking years later, <laughs> like he's hired years later, often. What is he supposed to do? Be there at the scene? Like you can't go backwards. Yeah, he he would not have risked his reputation on a case such as this. Um, you know, to provide bad information. So and he was paid up front before he even looked at anything. So they they can't even use that as an excuse. Yeah. He's not paid for his opinion. He's a paid paid for, for doing work. the job. Yeah. Right. And I definitely would take Arden any day over a local ME. Or a corner. Uh, or yeah, a corner. Yeah. yeah. I was Especially say. when they're uh, elected coroners that have no educational background in <laughs> Especially when a coroner and a medical examiner can't even get together and get their time of death correct. Right. So if you guys are interested, um, I, I do a 
I do a, a presentation nationally on junk science, what, what PIs and criminal defense attorneys need to know about forensic science. I also do uh, a presentation on advancing your investigation through forensic science. And I delve deeply into uh, the, the dilemma our nation is facing in regards to manner of death determination, uh, accident, homicide, suicide. And I go, I go through step by step what the problems are um, in regards to how medical examiners make a manner of death determination, such as accident, suicide, homicide, natural death, undetermined, and how they make that determination based on no information from the investigative agency. Okay, so that's exactly what happened in Christian's case. They made a determination of suicide early on within hours after his death before they conducted a thorough investigation. And that thorough investigation should have been a psychological autopsy, a victimology investigation, a suicidology investigation. None of that was done. For them, for them to re rule it's a suicide, they should have done their due diligence, and they did not. So, anyway, if you if you would ever want me to to discuss the problems our nation is facing in regards to manner of improper manner of death determination um, and certification on death certificates by medical examiners, I'll be happy to do that. And I will tell you that Dr. Arden would support what I have to say. Yes, we would right. love it. Yeah, we would love to have yeah. that. Yeah. We'll have to Whenever plan that with you. Okay. I just got a message from Boat Mama. And she wants me to tell you, Mark, she greatly appreciates you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I appreciate you all. Yes, we are so happy that you joined us. And we can't say thank you enough. I know that you're busy. And um, somebody's asking Mark a question here in the chats. Oh, the viewer participation. Um, you know, I'm such a novice. I haven't put anything on YouTube in, in almost a year. And, uh, I, I need help because I, I'm, I'm pretty inexperienced, uneducated, dumb when it comes to that. So, well, you um, got us. Yeah, okay. you have us. We'll, we'll help you out. All right. I'll reach out to you. Because there's stuff, you know, I have a thing. I've had a plan for months. I want to do a Forensic Friday where every, yep. every Friday someone can learn something about forensic science and apply it to, you know, their true crime interest. That's, that's yeah. interesting. That, that would be good. Yeah, let us know. We'll help you set everything up. And Heavy yeah. Crown Radio... Big shout out to you. I love you, girl. <laughs> we love our Denny, too. Sad her phone died. So um, Sunday next week is roundtable. We'll see you 5 o'clock or your time. I don't remember. You're 7 or 8. Are you I'm, Eastern? I'm cent Central. You're Central. Central. So, so seven, you'll be 7. seven years later. I'll send you the link uh, in advance. And I'll send it to Denny, too, so she could be prepared. Okay. Thanks for letting me be on here. I hope I didn't monopolize too much. I apologize if I did. No, no you didn't. Sir. No, sir. We love we having it. you. Yeah. It helped make it easier on us too. So thank you. And bye everybody. See you next Sunday. Well, y'all did a great, great job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.